with a big stand like Stone Cold with a few bears. Play the game, I end the game. I'm champion and I'm Triple H. Undertaker, I'm your maker. Bury the brother like Kane. Ooh, one three, hit the tombstone, hit the choke slam on face. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, like a macho heel, tell like a muscle. If you suck with lots of muscles, I'ma keep a couple models. Ooh, and you may call me HBK when I'm tuning up the fame. You best be getting in my way. Ooh, yeah, I'm degenerate. I love it, yes I love it. If you wait, down with that, then I got two words for you. Suck it. Welcome everyone to your longest running Australian wrestling podcast, Wrestle Radio Australia. I'm your host, Todd Eastman. Thank you for joining me this week, guys. Um, I can't normally say like I normally say, happy when I enjoyed local pro wrestling this weekend in the country because there's been bugger all of it really around. I think UPW did a show last weekend up here in, in Queensland. I'm not too sure what happened in Adelaide because um, <clears throat> again, uh, I'll, look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. We might be out of lockdown up here in Queensland. We still have the mask mandates and all of that sort of stuff. But it still very much feels like we're still in a lockdown where um, there was a promotion just, just recently. In fact, last weekend, uh, I know UPW still ran a show, but uh, there was another show that was going to run this past weekend. And they were in a, a in running from a hall that was governed by a local city council. And the local city council reclassified professional wrestling as a contact sport instead of theater therefore the show was not allowed to go on because of COVID restrictions no contact sports no community sports that sort of deal uh, i'm just wondering how that will affect other um councils other other shows around the country that run stuff out of council halls whether that might happen to them i think i raised it on on the wrestle radio australia twitter about that sort of thing. And it's something that we need to keep an eye on and maybe, yeah, I don't know what we can, we can't do anything to prevent it. We can't do anything to stop it. We'll just maybe keep an eye out. So a day before or two days before a show, they don't come out and do this. It was just what happened to this promotion, like two days out from their show or three days out from their show. We're told, sorry, you're now classified as this. You can't run your show. Um, yeah, not cool, but it, like, unfortunately it is what it is. I guess. And um, myself personally, um, I am, we're always honest here at WrestleRate Australia. I'm not feeling the best when it comes to um, mentally dealing with, the, with this sort of stuff. It's, it's, it's getting me down a little bit because it's been, God, I don't know, maybe two months now since I've, I've been able to go out and have a, have go out and perform and, and do my, thing as, as a manager and, and that sort of stuff and it's, it's getting to me so I can't imagine how it's getting to people in other states like in Melbourne's and in New Sydney's and all of those those guys and girls who get to go out and wrestle and I'm not discounting what, what I do as a manager but I imagine it's, it's so much more for the guys and girls that are, are training every week still from their homes because there's no contact and, and you can't gather and all of that sort of stuff um Perth and, and South Australia, hopefully the shows are getting back up soon. And so we can start seeing some stuff coming out of there. And then I can't wait to sort of see that stuff. But for us on the East Coast at the moment, it is quite, quite, quite a dark time when it comes to this sort of thing. And, and I'm really trying to kick out of it myself and, and get a positive mindset and all of that sort of, sort of thing. But it's hard at times. And I'm not here crying, but I'm just here being honest. So uh so that's that i guess when it comes to that but on to to happier news i guess um my guest this week is um tyson baxter who well i want to have him on because i wanted to talk about all the good stuff that he's been doing with with working as a heel at deathmatch down under and the stuff that he's been doing with 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 jet as um mile high club and then and was really excited to talk about all the stuff to do with, with Jet and Mile High Club and the tagging and, and what they, they plan doing and how they work all their sort of stuff and, and all that things. And the day that, that, that Tyson and I were set to get together and record is the day that Jet announced his retirement from pro wrestling. And um, so we put somewhat of a spanner in the works for this interview, but um, I really do, do like Tyson. He's a great kid really puts thought into his his um work which i love i love that about him and i, I probably mentioned like a hundred times during the interview um but yeah one of the guys that is on the up 
And um, even though his tag partner has has retired, there is nothing but good things in the future for Tyson. Um, before we go, though, guys, to the interview, make sure you subscribe to WRA. It's free. You can do it on Stitcher, iTunes, or Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you get your podcasts from, Spotify. Uh, if you do stop by Apple Podcasts, give us a five-star rating review. Helps us get inside more ears. Share the show and spread the word about professional wrestling in this country like we do every week. If you go to YouTube, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you know every time a show pops up, you will know straight away that it's there to be watched. Um, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Wrestle Radio Australia, and on Twitter at Wrestle Radio AU, and also Instagram, Wrestle Radio AU, or me personally on Twitter at Beast Eastman. Um, Please support the local industry as much as you can. If it's going to wrestlermerch.com and buying one of the shirts from, from one of the wrestlers from around the country, um, I guess this week Tyson Baxter has, has stuff up there. Please go and support him, especially in, in times where no one's having shows, so there's not really, they're not making any money from any anything. It's been, and a lot of guys aren't making money because there's no work going on because everything's shut down. Uh, if you can support anyway, please do. Uh, if you can't and, and you want to show your support in one way, shape, or form, um, just give them a follow, share stuff that they put up. Just really get around and support these guys. Support Australian wrestling like we do here every week at Wrestle Radio Australia. Um, anyway, you can support us. There's no real way. You can go to redbubble.com, look up Wrestle Radio Australia. Uh, I've got the new logo t shirts and that sort of stuff. Uh, any profits from that go to Beyond Blue and Gosh for Life, which are two charities that we really do love here at um, Wrestle Radio Australia. It's something that, that we um, really do support, uh, especially in these times. So uh, that is it for us. And that is it for the preamble. We go to Tyson Baxter right after this from Wrestle Radio Australia. Great guy. Uh, world in his hands can't wait to see what he does and we'll be back after this with tyson baxter right here on wrestle radio australia Shazza, Shazza. Ever since this match got announced by Deathmatch Down Under, all I've been hearing is Shazza McKenzie this and Shazza McKenzie that, and quite frankly, I am sick to death of it. What about the guys you're stepping in the ring with, huh? What about the guy who for the last five years has been staking his claim as the future of Australian wrestling? What about the guy who two years ago should have had his career ended by a serious knee injury, but came back in half the time? Shazza, April 17th, as the show is appropriately named, I am not here to fuck spiders. I am here to continue making a name for myself in this country. But this time, it's going to be at your expense. And after I beat you, everyone in Deathmatch Down Under is going to be talking about me. And they will realise why you don't doubt Tyson Baxter. Tyson Baxter, how are you doing today, mate? I'm good, Todd. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of a bittersweet day, really, isn't it, for you? Because um, yeah, the the it's day yeah the day we're recording this is actual earlier today. His uh, tag team partner Jet Ruka announced his retirement, and I, I expect that you would have pretty much had a good old heads up that this was this was coming along. But it's probably still a bit of a shock to you that it's sort of official now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, funny enough, I got a Snapchat from Jet this morning saying, um, going to find out if I'm going to retire or not. Um, I think he was at the uh, surgeon's office to figure out if he needed surgery or not. Um, it was something that he was talking about for a while to come. He was just weighing up his decisions to see what was better for him in terms of like longevity and like what he wants to do for the future. Mm. So he eventually ended up making the call and he told me it was one of the hardest decisions he's ever had to make. And I can only just empathize with him. Yeah, it would be. I mean, like not because of injury or anything, but even over this COVID break, I was myself was just like, should I just hang it up? It's like I'm old. Should I just hang it? And it was still, it was still a real like I just because it's something that I know that he loves, it's something I love, something you love. It's it would be hard to walk away from it. But when you're told by like a doctor 
that this can affect your long-term health, then I suppose it's really a no-brainer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jets, uh, Jets eggs have never been completely in the wrestling basket. Like he said in his, um, in his run, his run up today, he usually uses it as a creative outlet rather than like something you wanted to make a career out of. And when you're limited with injuries and like, you know, life getting in the way, it makes it a little bit harder to focus time into that creative outlet. So what he wanted to do in life ended up tying up with the, what he wanted to do in wrestling. So he just had to, you know, make the right call for himself. Mm. And because I know, I know that on the, on the, like in his real life, he's been leading towards teaching and all of that, because that helps out with the stuff he was doing at the, the MCW Academy, the, like you do, he could still probably be a lot of help at the MCW Academy. Anyway, you don't, you don't have to be wrestling to do that. You could still go and get that sort of side of your, the love of the game out by helping others, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, for someone who's only been in the business for about five years, Jet's got an absolute wealth of knowledge. And he's even said before that he prefers to coach rather than actually wrestle, which for some reason, that's really strange to me. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's like obviously not in a physical capacity, but still even more like verbal and even online, he still has the capacity to teach the next generation of wrestlers at the academy so hopefully he does stick with that but if he chooses to take his ventures elsewhere then i have absolute faith and trust in his choices mm. so for you does this um does this mean that you're on the hunt for a, a new tag team partner or you, do you want to focus now more on being a, a singles competitor i know it's really really fresh for you but it must be something that you've sort of thought of because he would have given you the heads up that this is this is when I find out oh, I don't know what's going on sort of thing. So it must be something that you've sort of mulled over in your mind before. Yeah, um, this is something that Jet's been having for about like he's been he's been discussing this with me for a few months now in terms of like weighing up his options. Um, and now that he's finally pulled the trigger on it, um, in terms of my career moving forward, it's opened up a bit of a Pandora's box in which. Um, like, yes, tag team wrestling is one of my like main loves in wrestling. I absolutely love tag team wrestling with a passion. But at the same time, it also allows me to hone my craft as a singles wrestler and be able to like develop more of a character that I'm starting to work with. Like, um, like DMDU, for example, I'm working as a singles wrestler there and I'm finally starting to get into my own groove and starting to feel what works for me naturally. So whether it do be in a tag team or a singles format, I think this is probably a good opportunity to not exactly refresh or restart, but start to continue the ball to be rolling in my singles career. But mm. if tag team is the way to go as well, um, then so be it. Mm. Cause the way I was, the, the, the way I thought about it, cause when I first heard, heard I saw, saw the post from Titan, um, from Jet straight away, I was just like, oh, they were like the number one babyface tag team in MCW. They were the, I said, oh, that's a real bummer. That's, but then I remembered, like, as being from seeing your work at Deathmatch Down Under, and I think even when I wrote uh, my review on it, I commented how I really liked your your heel work. I liked I liked the way you you sort of carry yourself a lot differently. You your um your offense too has changed up changes up from that is that something that's very conscious for you they like having to do that when you want to do it change the character you change a lot of things about the character um uh, naturally i can sometimes come across as a bit of a smart ass so <laughs> the heel work kind of plays into that a little bit um heel work is something that i haven't done much in my career oh, i've been wrestling for about five years now majority of that has been baby face work um so heel work was a bit out of my comfort zone for lack of a better term um and then when i started to get booked as a heel companies wanted to use me i'm like oh, i haven't really done much of it but i'll give it a crack um i got a fair bit of praise from promoters saying that the heel work is really good and they want to see more of it mm. and i wasn't sure if i was giving my full potential in terms of heel work because it was only like the first or second time i'd ever done it so I was just trying to figure out what kind of heel work clicks for me the best. 
Um, and it turns out that just being myself and just being that cocky idiot eventually ended up working, especially in um, Death Bash Down Under. And the, uh, the promoters over there are like, dude, just keep doing this. So it's mm. something that I could definitely dwell into because a lot of wrestling characters, they say, are just you turned up to 11. Um, but I think me at the moment is probably sitting at around five or a six. So <laughs> the, the possibilities are endless in terms of my um, character development at that stage. Yeah, and the more you're out there doing that side, the more comfortable you'll get and, and the more you'll think of, oh, if I do this, they'll hate that. That, that sort exactly. of thing. <laughs> like, for, for example, the one thing that I really loved, and it's, it's maybe a small thing, it's um, the knee brace spot when you put the guys. In. That I love is because it's you're using your surroundings and it's something that, like as a baby face, you wouldn't do because you wouldn't think about doing it. It's not something a, a good guy thinks about is using that. But the fact that you're like, I don't care. I'm going to use anything to win. Oh, this bit's metal. I'm going to use this and break their fingers. That to me, <laughs> that to me is like, it tells me that, that you're sort of, you're putting a lot of thought into that side of it. Yes. Um, Cause as far as I'm aware, I think I'm the only person in, I know for a fact that it's in Victoria at least, but I think I might be the only person in Australian wrestling that wears a knee brace of that like caliber. So I figured, especially when it comes to the heel work, like you said, a baby face wouldn't really use it to their advantage that much. I figured this is probably the best time to try to trial some stuff. Cause I've never seen anyone use their knee brace as a weapon, like mid match, like, for example, the only other reason I could think of was um, the Gargano Champa feud back in 2018, I think it was, where they had to finish with um, their STF with the knee brace over the face. face. But I'd never seen it in like a regular singles match format to which a point where the referee can just count for a five count for a break. And the first time I used it was against um, Chanel Phoenix in night one of the BMDU heavyweight title tournament. And it was a spur of the moment thing. I thought of it on the day. I'm like, maybe if I put someone's fingers in here, bend this way, see what would work and how the crowd would be able to visualize it. And Mm. I didn't think that something so small or so simple could get so much positive feedback. So it's definitely something that I'm going to start incorporating into my arsenal more often, especially as a heel. Yeah, it's kind of the thing like I find now when when I watch wrestling, because I've been around it for so long backstage and all that stuff, I'm sort of very analytical when i watch it i'm like oh you could have possibly not done that could have done that it takes a lot to pop me it takes something that like like i haven't seen before and when you did that that popped me i'm like oh very good like i think i even said that out loud when i saw it. I'm like very good because it's just those little it's those little things those little touches that really do like because it's a lot it takes a lot now for a heel, I find anyway, it takes a lot now for a heel to get a genuine heel reaction out of the crowd. Because a lot of times, if you're doing something that's bad, they're going to cheer regardless. And I, I find that if you can do things that, that, that will aggravate a crowd and just little things like that, it, 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 it just pops me. There's something that I love because it's like this person's really thinking about it and doing what a heel is supposed to do. And that is like rile a crowd up. Uh, do you, do you find that yourself that it's hard to get a genuine like heel reaction or even like a genuine baby face reaction nowadays with the way sort of wrestling is where fans will cheer for whoever they want. And it's fair enough. They, they're, they're allowed to cheer for whoever they want, but do, do you find it's hard to get that genuine reaction nowadays? Um, Funny you mentioned that in terms of the knee brace pop, because that's my biggest fear with that. It's going to get to that point where I keep using it and people are going to start popping for it, where I'm like, no, don't pop for me. I'm a heel. Um, (laughs) But even like you touched on with the baby face reaction, um, sometimes, especially in this day and age, um, wrestling fans are very sport for choice. And sometimes they don't even know what they want. So you could come out like people don't want to be sucked up to or told how to react so it's very hard in order to dictate the pace as a, as a wrestler in the ring. If you try to get the crowd on your side and try to get them to cheer for you, they're going to be like, well, no, you're telling me what to do, so I'm not going to do it. And that's why you get more of the fans cheering for the heels because they're basically, the, the fans are saying, hey, pay attention to me. And the heel wrestler says no. So the fans try to do as much as they can and interact as much as they possibly can to get a reaction from the heel. So by default, the heel ends up pandering to them and then they pop for it. So 
it's a very mixed bag and it all really depends on the company that you wrestle for as well. Like all places have different crowds. It's just trying to find what works for what crowd and some crowds might be hard, harder than others, but that's what separates a good wrestler from a great wrestler being able to adapt and figure out what works best for that particular setting. Mm, Cause I found, <clears throat> excuse me. I found lately that it's, it's been my bugbear lately that I hate the fact that we don't get to tell the crowd stories. They tell us like, <clears throat> I'm fair enough that in during a match that like, if you're hearing something, you react to it because that's, that's the match sort of thing. But overall as like a, 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 a wrestler or as, as a, a storyline sort of thing, we're supposed to be telling the story. Do you know what I mean? And for them to like, go, well, no, this is the story. I want. Well, that's not the story. You. This is the story you're getting. Now, if I'm a bad guy and I'm going over and you're hating that, guess what? You're supposed to hate that. So as much as you're arguing, complaining about it, you're supposed to be complaining about it. So when the baby face comes back and gets me, then you're happy. And I, a lot of the times I don't think that it's almost like crowds are trying to be too smart instead of going along for the ride. They're trying to say, no, this is where we want to go with the ride. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I get what you're saying. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Got something in my throat all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> so um, you've done the singles work with, with DM, uh, DMDU. You've, you've, well, now that you don't know what's going on at the moment with tag team work, work um, you've you really... You sort of, like you said before, you're sort of sport for choice. You, you, you might be able to get to choose which way you want to go. And, and being that this is all very fresh, it's sort of like, for one, this has actually thrown the interview completely because I had a whole list of <laughs> I wanted to talk about. But um, you, and, you and Jed had been friends forever and you've been tagging forever. Uh, do you think now that if you do find a new tag partner, it will be hard to get that groove that you had with with Jet just because you sort of like you've been friends forever so you can sort of almost know what he's thinking where now you have to almost if you do that again start from scratch yeah um like you touched on before Jet and I have known each other for about like nine years now we both played um footy together when we were teenagers um he is I'm the reason he is was in the wrestling business to begin with he came to one of my first ever shows Loved it, wanted to join up, and he just took it from there. Um, unfortunately, he became uh, better than me. <laughs> so that was frustrating. <laughs> um, but like you said, with that connection, because we obviously are um, best mates, not only in the ring, but also out of the ring as well. Like we're housemates too. So um, being around each other nearly all the time helps with that connection too. And even before we were living together, we always had that connection. We always just like vibed on the same wavelength. So Finding a tag team partner that connects with me the same way that I connect with Jet is definitely going to be a challenge, but it's not impossible. Sometimes, like you said, if I'm trying to figure out like what that person's thinking might be a bit more difficult with somebody who's not Jet or somebody who I'm not too familiar with, but that's the beauty of tag team wrestling. Who knows what kind of combinations and what creations can come from a new pairing. So Mm -hmm. I am very excited to see where the future takes me in that aspect, whether it be tag team or singles, but if it does happen to be tag team, um, yeah, I'm very excited for the ride. Because you were you um you and Jet sort of you started out tagging really together, didn't you? So is is tag team been something that like well you started before him, of course, but when you got together, was it something where like when he started training, you were just like, We should ta- we should team up as soon as we can, sort of thing? Or was it just like was it promoters that saw you and just go, Well, you guys are best mates, why don't you try this? Uh, It was kind of a bit of column A and a bit of column B. So uh, obviously we started training together. Um, All all friends that get into wrestling together want to be like, oh, let's be a tag team. We'd be so cool as a tag team. Um, Some promotions, we put it forward of us as a tag team and others potentially either thought it would be a good idea to put us as a tag team before that or saw uh, saw our tag team work elsewhere and be like, oh, cool, let's bring these guys over as well. Um, before we were a tag team, I remember our first full year in wrestling was 2017. All Jet and I wanted to do was wrestle each other. And we finally got the chance at the end of that year. 
And then comes 2018, all we did was wrestle each other and we got sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> to the point where at the same time, we were starting to establish ourselves more as a tag team, going to different promotions and kind of honing our craft to the point where eventually we got um, booked on MCW in 2019. Um, so the tag team, I guess you could say birth for Mile High Club was very early doors. It's something that we've always spoke about, but never really actioned because at that stage in our career, we didn't want to dictate what we did and didn't want to do. Yeah. It was more trying to put the feelers out there and be like, hey, we are really close friends. What do you what do you say about us as a tag team? And seeing who basically took the bait. Yeah, it would have been a thing like, <clears throat> when you guys were wrestling all the wrestling each other all the time and then also tagging other places almost saying to promotions look look we've we're kind of tagging everywhere it sort of doesn't make sense us keep fighting each other here mm. it's, sort of, <laughs> it's that that sort of thing i don't like i kind of as a as a former a booker promoter sort of thing i always kind of try to adhere to whatever the person was doing in other places just to keep the, the continuity going. Like I don't, yeah. I, it's, it's fair enough. If you want to go, look, I have an idea for you to go baby face or heel. I know you're a, you're a big baby face here, but this is what I would like you for here. That's one thing. But when like, I don't, there's, there's a couple of rules I have. Like I don't like champions for other feds taking a fall in a match. I just, because I like to respect, other promotions and if people are tag teams i don't really like them working against each other because it's like everyone knows them as a tag team partner they're going to be going well why are they fighting here why are they not like <laughs> it's sort of like it's it, if, if anything it makes the job harder for you guys i think when you're out there because when yeah that's in, independent wrestling in a nutshell for you yeah yeah because when you're in a match it's sort of like it's it's hard enough nowadays to get people to to suspend disbelief for a while but then to also put on the fact that well these guys are best mates and tag everywhere else now i'm supposed to believe that they hate each other just here so yeah. just so just in geelong they hate each other but everywhere else <laughs> <laughs> they're fine <laughs> um so you've just started you, you like you said you just started your heel work is it something that you're really like gravitating to because it seems when when i saw you out there and I, I don't know i can't remember if you said it was one of your first times i think it was when you, you worked chanel you looked fairly comfortable out there in that role is that more of a like you said you're a bit of a smart ass you come across a bit of a smarter is that more a comfortable role for you in in the heel work or have you found it something that that's been easy for you to adapt, adapt to or do you still find yourself sometimes little those little baby face tendencies where you reach to the crowd for some support or something and then go I'm not supposed to do that right now sort of sort of thing or is it <laughs> one of those things um i find it easy i think it um in wrestling generally speaking i think it's a lot easier to make people dislike you than it is to make people like you so heel work by that default makes it is a bit um easier than baby face work um and when it came to the heel work i tried to figure out like i mentioned earlier what kind of heel work worked best for me and i had this idea when i found out that i was going to be working as a heel especially for um for dndu that i wanted to be this angry like take no shit heel who just wants to beat people up but my resting angry face isn't exactly the greatest <laughs> and it felt a little bit unnatural and felt a little bit forced to try to put on that kind of facade so i figured I may as well just like relax, take it easy, like a smart ass, um, mm. see how that goes, like trial, like throw stuff on the wall and see what sticks. Um, and it turns out that the smart ass stuff ended up sticking um, a bit easier to get reactions when you're just being yourself and being you know, naturally hateable like I am. Um, but yeah, uh, that kind of like smart ass stuff, just, it just felt easier. I didn't have to force anything. I didn't try to have to pretend to be something that I wasn't. Um, and if me just doing what I naturally do elicits a negative reaction from the crowd, then I'm just going to keep doing it and build on that. <laughs> yeah. Cause when, when you walked out, you had that, that, cause I was like, Oh, I wonder what type of a heel he's going to be when you, when you sort of started walking out and then you sort of had that sort of like cocky smile to him. Like that's yeah, that's kind of, that works for him. That, that whole like relax almost 
like you said, relaxed. It's sort of like a relaxed, I don't care what you do because I'm better than you anyway. It's not going to matter sort of thing. And people and, hate the mustache as well. So that's a big <laughs> pop thing too. Uh, I, can't really, I can't really grow a full one, which is very annoying to me. You'd think by at my age I'd know how to do it yet, but yeah, no, it doesn't happen. <laughs> I got I grew one for November one year, and my wife said I look like a used car salesman. So I was like, yeah, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of that. <laughs> it's crazy how something so simple as facial hair can piss off a crowd. So I'm like, if they get irritated by something as simple as that, I'm gonna keep it and they make it worse. Yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly. I think um, back in the day, Cree did that with his uh, Chris Basso. He was like, he grew up, I can't remember why he did it. He did it for some stupid reason. But then he did the whole, like the waxing. And, yep. he, noticed, and he noticed that was getting heat. So all of a sudden there was so much more wax and it was so much more. I was like, dude, eventually you're going to have to stop doing that. <laughs> He's like, not, yeah. till the, not till the booze stop. <laughs> all the gimmicks. Uh, do you, um, do you, do you, do you have set, and it's hard to say anything at the moment because of the way the world is, but do you have like a set goal that you want to achieve by a certain time? Or is it sort of like, I'm just going to, at the moment, I suppose you just sort of have to take it as you come, but is it sort of a thing where like, I want to be the, the, the inner Commonwealth champion, or I want to be the, the DMDU champion, or I want to be X champion by this time. I want to set myself a, a, a target or is it sort of like, I'm just going to do as much as I can, as good as I can, and then I'll get noticed and I'll eventually get these, these accolades, I guess. Um, not specifically in wrestling, but just in my general life, I find um, goal setting with a time limit a little bit counterproductive in which I'm going to put myself under so much stress if I try to reach a goal by a certain deadline. And then if I happen to fail that goal, it's going to crush me even more than if I don't get it overall. So I like to let things happen naturally, let it take its course, just put in the effort and reap the rewards whenever they come. Um, wrestling has always been a career goal for me. My, um, my aim is to make a living doing what I love. Um, potentially that might be moving overseas down the line, but I don't want to put all my eggs in that basket like really quickly and it ends up blowing up in my face. Hence the no setting a goal by a certain yeah. time uh, phase. Um, I just want to hone my craft where I'm comfortable here in Australia as much as I possibly can while still making a living on my nine to five. Um, and then eventually when time permits, uh, take my experience elsewhere broaden my horizons, try to expand my, um, my network. But for the time being, just going to try to knuckle down, but eventually like when the uncertainty that is COVID is finally out of the picture, just wrestle as much as possible against as many people as possible at as many places as possible. Just get reps up, rep after rep after rep under my belt. Cause you're not going to get better until you just have more and more matches. And that's, I just want to try to be the best wrestler that I could possibly be. Mm, cause, cause they're for a, for a time there, there was sort of like you're at MCW one week, you're at DMDU the next week, you're at Wrestle Rock, then you've got um, like Mayhem. You you were really, you, all of you really in Melbourne were starting to get on that roll where there was just shows every weekend. It was so good. And then all of a sudden, old Delta raises her ugly head and, and everyone's back in back in the house. How, how um, is it a real a, a gutting thing for you or is it the sort of thing where this is just what we have to do. And it's, it's nothing you, you really sort of, I, from a personal standpoint at the moment, I'm just like, this is just what we have to do. There's, I, there's no point in getting angry about it or, or getting upset about it or stressing myself out about it because there's something I can't control is for, for you guys. Is it like that? Cause I know in Melbourne, you guys went through a hell of a time last year, with the how long your lockdown was. And it oh, yeah. seems, and it seems to me that like every time, the words lockdown come up in Melbourne, it's sort of like there's some, some PTSD from the last time that you're like, no, it's, I know it's not going to be a week because it always happens that way. It always starts that way. Is it, is it sort of like that? Or are you, are you almost, almost, certain, so almost have a, a fallback plan now? Well, it's lockdown. We're just going to do exactly what we did last time and keep ourselves busy. Yeah. Um, it's gotten to the point where it's more frustrating, if anything, 
Where some of them would go into like lockdown, then get released, then go back into lockdown, get released again. And it happens over and over and over to the point where I think I've just stopped getting my hopes up in terms of like freedom. Um, <laughs> when I find out that wrestling is back on the cards when we are, um, when our restrictions are eased, it's like, all right, sweet, we're going to be wrestling. I know this isn't going to last very long, but I'm just going to take it for what it is now. Yeah. Um, and especially last year with the massive lockdown, that one hit the hardest particularly because I had already missed the previous year with my knee Rico. Mm. I missed that full year, came back for, I think it was three matches, then went into lockdown for another year. So I was missing a lot of time wrestling. Then we finally got out of that second lockdown, started to get the ball rolling, getting a few more reps under my belt. And then four more lockdowns followed after that. So kind of halted any momentum, not just for myself, but for anyone in Melbourne wrestling. Just they can't really get the ball rolling. It's hard for promotions to tell any kind of long-term stories because of how stop start everything is. Yeah, yeah, that that's exactly right. Well, for for example, like we just uh, up here in Queensland, we just came out of lockdown, but our lockdown literally happened. Like I packed my gear bag to get ready to go, and I, I usually leave about one thirty to get to the show, about two thirty, and, and that sort of stuff. But at midday and uh, press conference, oh, we're in lockdown from four o'clock. So I was like, oh, all right. Yeah, I heard about that. I'll just unpack the gear bag, I guess. Uh, but it's like, such a quick enforcement as well. Like, yeah, what, you can't get started at that point. Yeah, they don't, they don't mess around up here, mate. It's sort of like everyone get inside, and uh, it's or sort else. of yeah, or else, or else. But um, it's sort of the, the the one upside, if there is even an upside for for <laughs> you, at least, is you might have had that year off because of your knee and then you've come back, but you also had that extra time now where you got to, to heal it up even more. You know what I mean? In yeah. case, because I know it's always the way where, where you're young and you, you sort of want to rush back and that sort of thing. But this almost made you not rush back. If that makes sense. It made you like your knee is perfectly right now. Cause you've had two years to, to have it cherry ripe. Yeah, Exactly. Uh, is is that something now? Because I know when when um, some people have injuries, when they first get back in the ring, it takes that first land or that first hit on something to make you go, oh, "No, I'm okay. I'm all right. I'm all right. Everything's good. I'm fine now." Was it that that way for you, or was it just always? It's always in the back of your mind, or is it just like you're just straight ahead? Um, majority of the time, it's usually straight ahead for me, uh, especially when it comes to actually like participating in a match uh my injury is like the last thing i think about like i don't even worry i'm just on autopilot doing my thing and if i come out injured or unscathed then i worry about it after the match i just keep trying to push through as much as i possibly can at that point (laughs) um and the extra year off did definitely help in terms of recovery it also like not only recovered from the regular rehab but it also gave me a little bit more time to strengthen the affected area too so I have my slip ups here and there, just some general soreness as you do, but nothing's completely debilitated me since. Mm. And I'm hoping to keep it that way once we get back <laughs> into the wrestling. Yeah, well, that's always that's always the plan. Uh, you you um you also work at the um the MC Dub Training Academy. Uh, how much have you found that the teaching helps your own game? Because I've I've often heard guys that say. Like I'll be teaching, I was teaching a class and I've realized well, that's something I've been doing wrong for them. Why, why don't I, is it, is it something like that? Have you found that that sort of thing happens with you where you're telling a, yep. a class something and all of a sudden something clicks in your head you're like, oh, I really should be doing that. <laughs> I'll literally pause in a class for like 10 seconds and it will dawn on me and like, oh shit, maybe I should start doing that more often. And then I realized, oh, I've got a, I got a class to teach. There are people waiting for me right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, it does happen more often than not from a coaching standpoint. You do, you go to teach something and there's a separation between the teaching and the actual implication for your own like ability as well. Mm-hmm. You'll go to teach something and then you'll realize that you don't do that yourself or you've been doing it wrong yourself. And sometimes it's actually like the, the students who point it out like they'll ask the question and be like, oh, what about this? Or what happens when you do this? And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, I should, maybe I should think about that more often. <laughs> but um, yeah, coaching is definitely eye-opening in terms of like personal development as well. Mm. I, often, I, I can't remember what, what podcast it was that I heard it on, but this was like 
yesterday. I was listening to a podcast when I was at work and they were talking about, he was talking about the word selling. And he said he was in a car with, with an old um, a, a Japanese wrestler and the Japanese wrestler like grabbed his ear and pinched it really hard. And he said, look at yourself in the mirror. And he, he said, wow, well, let me go, let me go. So let him go. And he, then he did it again and worked it. So it wasn't really, there we go. He goes, now make that face you made before. That's selling. <laughs> and like in my head, I was just like, well, yeah. Because oftentimes when, when we talk about selling, we talk about you have to sell the reaction that, that you got hit, but not that you're registering pain. Do you know what I mean? A lot of the times people yeah. are just like, like, oh, I got hit, but they're too busy like doing that to really realize that they have to register to the crowd that they're actually in pain. And it's something that I'd never really thought about until hearing that analogy. And I've gone, no, oh, well, that's something new. It's like nine years and I'm just learning this. This is great. <laughs> uh, yeah, you- like registering the pain on that level. Um it shows a sense of relatability to the crowd in terms of, in particular, like the dirty stuff, like the eye gouging, the eye poking, the hair pulling. 99% of people in a crowd will know what that feels like. They would have experienced that at some point in their lives. So it's easily relatable when someone like gets their fingers stood on as well, for example, as soon as they see that, they're like, oh, I know what that feels like. That must suck. Mm. Yeah, the, the one argument I'd already had, I'd, I'd always had with with some of the trainers when I was at, when, um in Riot City was like, they were sitting there going, um, they're talking about like, like, and I understand you've got to do it, like sell, sell your chest out so you can get hit again. And I was like, but the first thing I do if I get hit is cover up. That's a natural reaction. So why wouldn't I do that first and then open back up? And it was always that, that thing where you have to fight that natural. But I guess after a time, you find that balance of being able to do it and then still open up for your opponent is is that that's something that that you sort of how how much of an emphasis do you put on selling and and registering to a crowd at at the academy because it's it's possibly the biggest part of wrestling is being able to sell what's happening to you yeah um like you said it's one of the biggest parts of wrestling but at the same time i feel like it's also one of the most under un, underutilized and like underappreciated aspects of wrestling in which people just want to get in do the moves do all the cool stuff but not worry about the substance that's behind a match so we even drill it to the point where not only are they selling but they're selling to crowd side so we'll get them to sell to where all the people on the outside of the ring who's like waiting for their turn or watching, we get them to sell to those points of the ring. So that way, eventually when people are match ready, they're just going to do it instinctively and not have to think about where they are in the ring. Um, and yeah, selling is like, like I said, it's a very underutilized thing. Um, not only just registering what's happened, but also, like you said, the residual effects like something someone gets hurt in a particular body part for example they'll sell it initially but depending on the severity of the impact they'll continue to sell it throughout the match Mm. like a good a good example i like to see is for example like even probably more so from a heel but even from a baby face perspective as well someone throws a right hand to knock someone down and they're still selling that hand after it even though they're the one that did the offensive move yeah, because punching something solid is going to hurt your hands. You can't just pretend that it doesn't. That's something that uh, Lance Storm does that I love. He'll throw a he'll throw a left and then go after he's done it. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like like oh geez, that guy's jaw hurt because it would, it would hurt you if you, you've done that. Yeah, I, I think really. Yeah, I think I've been I've been thinking about like selling that a lot more recently since like this past week. Uh, Bobby Eaton passed away. So I've been watching a lot of like um, Midnight Express rock and rolls and just of like how good Ricky Morton was in selling and then mm-hmm. like, like that, that trying to draw that crowd into, to the points where like, there's some points where he's literally crawling to the ropes, looking at it, a crowd member going, help me, help me sort of thing. And like, it was believable. Is that something that, that, um, you can still utilize today or do, do you find now that the crowds as like, as a baby face, do you find that crowds don't really buy into it as much or it's harder to get a crowd to buy into offense a lot more now? 
I think it's definitely harder to, like we mentioned before, like crowds don't, like some crowds don't like to be told what to do. So a baby face doing the perfect sale, reaching towards a rope, asking that one particular fan member um, to help them. They're going to just think that it's borderline stupid, but it all depends on like what kind of crowd you're dealing with, how you're selling as well. You can't just go from a hundred to zero like that. There's got to be a bit of a slow burn and a slow decline in your sell to make it believable. Where if you just go, if you just get shut down straight away and try to crawl around and be like, help me, help me. People aren't going to believe it. Whereas if you slowly get like dissected and beaten down to the point where you need to garner that sympathy, because another thing that I always got taught by um, Jay Andrews at the MCW Academy was you have to wait for the crowd to get behind you and feel the proper sympathy for you before you start to bring it back up and make some sort of a comeback. Because if you come back too prematurely or to the point where it's almost too late, they're not going to care. Mm-hmm. Where you've got to try to have them in the palm of your hand and, guy- and like gain that perfect amount of sympathy for the comeback to really be emphatic. I find that especially in um, in tag team wrestling, it's something I always preach is like, I don't care what you have have planned. If that crowd is ready to go for a hot tag, go for that hot tag. You know what I mean? It's There's nothing worse than hearing a crowd get to that point where they're ready to burst and the heel's just like, no, nah, I've got extra stuff. And then you feel the crowd go... Mm. And then when and the it's hot hard tag, to get back up to that point again. It's so hard. And then when the crowd, you eventually get that hot tag, it's like, yay. It's just sort mm. of like, oh, why did you do that? Is that something that that um that, that you found hard to get across to to some of because I notice it's mainly in the younger wrestlers that it's hard to to understand that that it's in a match, you might have all this stuff planned, but it's also a a balancing act of listening to like listening to the crowd when it's time to go for that. And maybe you had this cool thing planned, but that's, that's not more important than the reaction you're going to get from a crowd. If you do it at the right time. Yeah. I think something that is definitely overlooked by a lot of the younger generation of wrestlers is like organic moments and trying to adapt from the crowd and figuring out when the time is right, when the crowd's reacting at the right point. Um, a lot of people, and like I am guilty as charged as well. Um, a lot of the young guys, everyone really wants us to get their shit in. It's yeah. as simple as that. They think of all this cool stuff. Oh, this is going to be so cool. It's going to pop them huge. When in reality, you're, you're really only trying to like pop the boys and pop yourself. Like what you think is going to be like absolutely spectacular may not translate to the crowd that you're working with as well. Whereas something as simple as the crowd getting behind you and reacting to something like that could be like super simple in a match that's going to win over majority of that. And then you continue to play along with that to get a better reaction. So the, the organic moments in wrestling are definitely more natural, like in the sense of the word organic as well. <laughs> yeah. they, they come across a lot more naturally and it's a lot easier to register and digest than compared to like a man-made construct in that point. How, how long into working? Have you sort of did that sort of penny drop, or was there a moment when the penny dropped? You're like, no, we need to do this now. Back on the rest, let's just get this now because it's going to work. Um, I'll be the first to admit that I still struggle with it today. Um, I have a very like structured mind in the fact that like I need to have everything go in order and according to plan. Otherwise, I tend to like panic and not know what to do. Like even still, I'm very young into my career as well. Um, it's something that I definitely want to improve on in terms of longevity, but um, I'm just trying to take it bit by bit as it comes. Um, I have had a, like a, my handful of um, naturally organic occurring moments in matches to the point where that guard is a massive reaction. I'm like, oh, that's, that's something as simple as that. But that's the thing. You can't plan natural moments because they just happen naturally, like in, in its namesake. Mm. Yeah. It's funny when you sit there and you'll be, you'll be backstage and, you'll have done a thousand things and the crowd have reacted really well. Then you see someone go out there and just do this, just the littlest thing and the crowd pop huge for you. Like, well, that's just annoying. I worked my ass off and all this, all this dude this did was have a catchphrase that the crowd loved. And it's, it's just gotten over so well, like squat. Like you, yeah, can go, the, um, <laughs> you can go out there and do all these moves. He walks out there, squats and the crowd loses their shit. Mm-hmm. 
It's what se- it's like I mentioned before. It's what separates a good wrestler from a great wrestler. A great wrestler knows what to do to garner a reaction. And sometimes, like the old cliche in wrestling goes, "Less is more," and that's absolutely correct. Like you don't have to do absolutely everything in the world in order to get a massive reaction. Sometimes it's going to be the smaller things that get the biggest like reactions. And it's about capitalizing on those moments and just continuing from there. Mm. So um, I was going to ask what tag teams you'd like to work with being the team, but we can't, we can't do that. Um, is, there, is there any like people from around? I know that there's, there's your normal wish list of, of your Davis Storms and all of that stuff that you'd love to work. Is there someone that, that people wouldn't really think of that you would love to work with? Um, like you said, there's, oh, I've got a wish list a mile long in terms of wrestling. <laughs> I've got a lot of lost time to make up for. Uh, but a couple of names that spring to mind. Um, he is starting to get a little bit more well known in Australian wrestling. Um, Emin the Kid from Malaysia, he's someone who came to the country a couple of years ago, and I was originally supposed to be his first opponent in Melbourne, but uh, plans obviously changed. That's around the time when I got injured as well. Um, he is someone I'm yet to step in the ring with and who I would absolutely love to. I'm a massive fan of his work, and I feel like we could put on an absolute like barn burner of a match. Um, another person I'd really like to work down the line, um, Tony Villani from the MCW Academy. Uh, I've watched him develop from day one at the MCW Academy to the wrestler that he's become today. And it feels very rewarding and satisfying to see how far he's come in that time. And it's almost, I wouldn't exactly say it's like a passing torch because I'm still very young myself, (laughs) but um, I feel like it'd be a very feel good moment. Uh, on a personal level to wrestle somebody who's come up with me as well. Mm. Yeah. Cause as much as, as much as you've got goals that, that you, of people that you'd want to work with, there are also guys that you'd like to see, like I could really help this person. I suppose you're at almost, even though, you, as you say, you're very young into your career, being that you, you're working at the Academy and you're training these guys, there must be some guys that you see and just go, I'd really like to work with him. Cause I think I could help him out a lot. Like I think last last episode I talked to Carter Deems and he was like that with uh, Ben Braxton. He sees Ben Braxton always at the New Year Pro Academy. He's like, I'd love to work with him like eventually as a tag team because I, I can see that I could help him, that sort of thing. Um, with with yourself, is there, is there a, a part of your particular part of your game that you really want to, to strengthen up, whether it be your... your, your, your yeah, mat wrestling or even promos, that that sort of thing. Especially, I guess, being that, that you're sort of taking a a turn into to working heel, I, I would think that that promos are something that you would have to really try and work on now because that's half our story is telling is by doing those promos to talk people into the building. Is it something that that you guys? I know that you at MCW Academy you have crackers there that helps with the training with training with promos and all of that sort of stuff. Is that, that's something that, that it's sort of like a, a tool that you want to strengthen in your game, or is it something that you're fairly confident with already? Uh, promos is definitely something that I do want to strengthen in particular promos that are done on the fly. Um, as you can tell by this podcast, I fluff my words a bit and I tend to stutter quite a lot. Um, so it's just a matter of confidence in speaking, especially when it's unprovoked. Um, Majority of the promos that I do, probably all of them actually, um, I pre-plan and I structure to the point where I redo after redo after redo until I finally get the point across and don't like trip on my words or have to like most embarrassing thing and have to be doing a retake like Psycho Sid in a live promo. But um, promos is always something that I want to get better at, especially when it comes to portraying the character that I am trying to portray and not being able to vocalize that is a bit of a struggle in terms of getting the character across. Mm -hmm. And on the topic of character as well, like I mentioned, my heel work has been a little bit more natural as of recent, but I still want to try to work on how to connect with a baby face character because I feel like my natural mystique goes more towards the heel side where again, like I mentioned, it's a lot harder to make people like you than to make people dislike you. So I just want to try to find that balance of baby face character work. That's going to get people to like me without coming across as too like cheesy or forced. Yeah. Like you're begging people to like you. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, but you like you, you said something that that I that uh, already tells me that 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 you're on the right track because you said I like to pr- plan my stuff out and like keep doing take after take after take until I get it right. And that to me is like that's that's the, the biggest part of it because too many people go, oh, I know I screwed that up, but it's good. It's it's good enough. It's good enough. And that 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 really, I don't say anything at the time, but it annoys me when people do that. When they'll they'll, they'll flub something and they go, nah, it should be right. It was good enough. The rest of it was fine. And then back in my head, I'm like, okay, that's yep, that's fine. That's good. Whereas if it's myself, if I've if I've screwed a line up, I will go back and. And do that line again if if it's a good line. Um, I've been lucky enough where, like, not too many times I'll say a promo the same way between takes because I'll say something I'm like I could have probably said that better. Then if I get a next take, I will say it the way I wanted to say it the second time. Yeah. And um, but it's it's good that that you have you have an idea of how you want to do it because no, there is no set perfect way to do promos like you're you're a planner and you like to have do you have dot points or do you have actual you'll write out the whole thing and try and memorize it um jack can probably even attest to this as well i have a freakish memory when it comes to just everyday life <laughs> um so i like to i don't even write down my promos most of the time like or even like match planning for example i'll just remember everything off the top of my head it's just a matter of like remembering sequences and patterns to the point where I know once I say or do this, this is going to follow, followed by that, 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 etc. cetera. Mm-hmm. So that's just the point of remembering everything, essentially. Not having to rely on any kind of cue cards or prompts, just trying to, when one thing happens, the rest of it will just flow on naturally. Mm. Well, that's good because like a lot of times it can be like, if you're not a very good actor, and I'm not saying that you're not, but if you're, you're not, if you're not a very good actor and you've written out everything, it will come out a lot of times, unless you're a good actor, it'll come out. Like I've written It's like Saturday night, I will get you. And you know what I mean? It's sort of like, it'll be, it'll be, I think because it's something that it sounds over rehearsed. It sounds, it sounds, it sounds like it's been written. And I, yeah. I, I, I suppose, and that's the problem. Like you'll see it all the time. Even in, in WWE, you see it when you get like, well, I know for a fact this guy is reading a script because it is clear this is not a word he would normally, like not something he would normally say. There are guys that look very natural when they're talking and there are guys yeah. that, that, that aren't. And it's good that, that you've, you've thought about what you want to say because even if you've got the memory like this is what I'm going to say, it will come out more like just naturally talking. Yeah, because- and you get some programs that are like, it's too ridiculous to the point where we're like, no one would ever talk like that. Like, why would someone ever say that in that way, shape, or form? Mm. I've done I've done promos before. I've stopped them halfway through. I was like, what? What is that? That's not a real thing. Who talks yeah. like that? Talk that. And sometimes that'll even go through to the actual promo because it, it's me being a smart. I was like, who talks like that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> but it's yeah, it's good to see. And how how um. How, how often do you do those, the promo classes at MC Dub? Is it a weekly thing or is it a monthly thing? Or is it how much emphasis is put on uh, promos at, in MC Dub? Because I would, I would assume a fair bit. Yeah, with, um, with lockdown in tow as well. Um, of course. They're usually done with Cracker Jack um, online where people can book in as well. Um, but usually they are done on a weekly basis, whether that be via Zoom or in person if lockdown permits. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely a part of my game that I tend to neglect as well. Um, very busy schedule when it comes to like work, training, gym, um, coaching. So it's hard to try to squeeze in a promo class here and there. Although when I do, it's definitely worth the while. Um, but we focus on promos and characters just as much as we do in ring at the MCW Academy. It's part of the grading criteria for beginner to intermediate, intermediate to advanced, and then et cetera after that. Um, is not only how you can work in ring, but how you can work with a promo on the fly and how you can develop character as well and all about the delivery. So we don't favor one more than the other. I think it's a bit of a 50-50 split. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it is really when you think about it. It's a whole a whole round again, like I, I, I always say, as many tools as you can put in your toolbox, the better a tradesman 
you'll end up being. So, and then the I guess the one thing too with because Melbourne went through such a a prolonged lockdown last year, you probably have a pretty much a gym in your garage now, wouldn't you? So it's sort of like you're already set with that. It's not like when this thing gets sprung on you, like you've got nowhere to do to work out. You've already got everything well, that's sort of set for you, haven't you? Yeah, I'm very fortunate that Jet has invested in a home gym to the point where during the first lockdown, he decided to buy some equipment. And then once we got out, he's like, well, I've got all the stuff I need here. I don't need to pay for a gym membership. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whereas some people like me, for example, prefer a gym setting. They feel a bit more motivated in that kind of environment. Whereas if I go home, I'm just going to go home to you know play PlayStation, not work yeah. out. But when it does come to those unfortunate times in which we are in lockdown and we can't go to the gym, it is a blessing in disguise. It's literally like a gym that I can walk two meters to when I'm already there. It's got yeah. everything to get us by and it doesn't cause me to start getting a little bit lazy or lackadaisical. It keeps me disciplined and motivated and I try to stay as ring fit as I possibly can given the circumstances. Yeah, it's going to be hard. Well, um. Mate, I hope you guys get out of this thing as soon as you possibly can. Because I, I know for the very for the, the small times that we do it up up here, it sucks, and I can't imagine how much more it sucks for you guys because of the the shit you went through last year. Uh, if oh, people yeah. if people want to follow you on their, their socials and all of that thing to find out exactly what happens to Tyson Baxter when everything when the world opens up again, how can they do that, mate? Uh, they can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Fever Pitch TV. Okay, and you also have a wrestler merch page? I do. Um, WrestlerMerch.com.au, I think. I can't remember. I think it's just, just .com. Just .com. <laughs> just look up Tyson Baxter on Wrestler Merch. I'll be there. There you go. Support him. Like, like I say every episode, guys, support these guys as much as you can. If not monetarily, like check out their, their, their videos. Like and anything you see pop up for these guys, get the word out about them. Um, if you can support monetarily at the moment, please do because nothing's happening at the moment. So please. The <laughs> please. Um, that is it for this episode of Russell Radio Australia. Tyson, thank you so much for coming on, mate. Um, not the best day to do it with, with the news you got and also with lockdown, but um, uh, tell, tell Jet all the best from us as well. But um, that's it for this episode of Russell Road Australia. Until next week, I'm Todd Eastman. We'll see you then. Pleasure, Todd. Thank you very much. Thanks, mate. Sweet, too sweet, too sweet, dear, dear. Too sweet, too sweet, put your fangs up. Too sweet, too sweet, pour another cup. Let's be busy 23.